coming up on Chopper's Politics. Are those talks going well within Russia and Ukraine? The talks within Russia and Ukraine uh, are impossible. I'm Christopher Hope, The Telegraph's Associate Editor for Politics, and this is Chopper's Politics. The assault on Ukraine continues, and the country's politicians, along with their leader, Volodymyr Zelensky, are continuing their calls for Western governments to do more to protect their country from Putin's forces. This week, a group of Ukrainian MPs travelled to Westminster for talks with their British counterparts something they would have had to have got permission for from their leader, as leaving their country, even as a politician, is currently a crime for those able to fight the Russians. One of those briefly in London is Lesya Vasilenko, a member of the Ukrainian Opposition Party and co-chairman of the UK-Ukraine Friendship Group. Lesya, welcome to the Red Lion Pub and thank you for joining us this week on Chopper's Politics. You've got a big day meeting all sorts of important politicians, not least our Prime Minister Boris Johnson. When you see him, what would you say to him? That we need a no-fly zone over Ukraine and that we need to ram up the support. And if it's not within the given frameworks that exist in the world today, then it's high time that the UK takes the lead on an anti-Putin coalition. You see why Boris Johnson hasn't been unable to enforce a no-fly zone, because they don't want to put NATO troops in direct uh, action with Russian planes or, or troops. So again, there's an option out of it to follow the UN Charter, to actually call on collective defence and uh, to build on a coalition of like-minded states that are actually feeling and living the uh, imminent risk of Russia's aggression spreading to them. That is Poland, that is the Baltic states, that is the Czech Republic, and I guess that is the UK as well. So you make it a UN operation not a NATO operation, and that, that would be a, a way of legally doing it. The way of legally doing it is definitely to go through a UN operation. Of course, the argument there is that Security Council is going to be blocking that, but there are ways that have been implemented through history that the General Assembly can a call for. full vote for the Assembly? Not, not even a full vote. No, 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 not a full vote. The rules, uh, the, the rules are different. You don't have to have a full vote. You have to have the support, I think it's of two-thirds of, of the General Assembly. It's still a lot, but it's support which can be gathered. But again, I go back to the idea of building o on a coalition of like-minded states. President Zelensky called on that yesterday when he spoke to the US Congress to build a U24 coalition, U standing for Ukraine and 24 for the 24 hours in which it is possible to get rid of the plague of Russian aggression once and for all, but only if countries unite. Are those talks going well within Russia and Ukraine? The talks within Russia and Ukraine uh, are impossible. Are impossible, why? Because the side that Russia uh, is represented by does not want to talk. They just want to fight and they just want to erase Ukraine off of the face of the earth. That's it. Everything they say turns out to be lies. The corridors, the green corridors, humanitarian corridors, they promised every single one of them was shot at. And people, civilians, unarmed men, women, children were killed in those corridors. They continued the civilian bombing. How can we talk with those people? How can anyone talk with those people? It's dominated the news pages for three weeks here and we are utterly shocked and the goodwill going out to your people is is extraordinary and, and completely heartfelt from Britain. I mean, we saw the report about the Russian bombs falling on the theatre where a thousand were sheltering and, and the words children were written on the, on the tarmac in Russian to say they were here. The Russians know what they're doing. They know exactly where they send their missiles and their rockets and their bombs. They know exactly who they shoot. What they're committing is war crimes and crimes against humanity, but those words are just dry legal terms. They don't do justice to the thousands that are killed and the thousands that are uncovered with severe wounds from the rubble. That theater in Mariupol ended with bodies being laid over in basements of hospitals, hospitals which serve as shelters to children and newborn babies. Can you imagine? Newborn babies, the first days of their lives, are spent next to corpses that are already dead or dying. These are the atrocities that people in Ukraine have to live through. And you, and you have family, of course, in Ukraine. Family, you have many, many friends there. 
I still have a lot of family there and a lot of friends there. When I go back over the next few days, I will try to evacuate them to safer places, as uh, staying in densely populated cities has its uh, certain privileges, but it also has its risks. When Kiev goes into curfew for 38 hours, it's impossible to go outside, it's impossible to get food, to get medicine, to get anything. And unfortunately, since a lot of the, the, the support networks of the older relatives and family and friends are engaged in the war efforts, we are na- aren't able to care for, for the vulnerable groups. So the task is now to get them out as far as possible from the war zone. Have you lost friends and family in the war? I was blessed not to have to and I hope that it will stay that way. And when you go back have you committed to taking up arms like some of your countrymen and women? I have arms if that is what you ask. I have arms in my home. Uh, Those are self-defense weapons as essentially all the weapons that Ukraine has right now because we are fighting all of us, each one of us, a war of self-defense. Overnight, we heard President Biden, Joe Biden, calling Vladimir Putin a war criminal. Does that help anything at all? It irritates Russia, for one. It did irritate, didn't it? (laughs) It did, it did. Uh, It labels them, it uh, stirs up waves inside of Russia of people who are aware of, or who want to be aware, at least, of what is going on in the world, making life uncomfortable for them. Listen, there's been some criticism in this country about how the government has handled getting enough Ukrainians into the country. Are you critical of the way it's been handled here? The way that I see it is that the UK has adopted a well-managed approach to getting Ukrainian refugees in. It's impossible to expect that countries who are further from the border with Ukraine will open up uh, their policies and their borders completely and to everyone. And I personally, I don't think there's a need for that. There's a need to support Poland. There's a need to support Slovakia, Moldova and all the other countries who are directly bordering Ukraine where the influx of refugees is biggest and uh, where they are at their most vulnerable. This first point of contact with the refugees is what needs to be enforced but further on it needs to be a well-managed system and this is what the UK is doing uh, what f- from what I have seen we will have to look in practice how it works exactly but the hundreds of millions of pounds which the government and the British people have given to the effort in in Poland and surrounding countries is the right one lots of aid money going in uh, there's there's more to be done of course mm. what we are seeing now the four million refugees which are already crossing the borders this is just the beginning of it I think that uh, money well spent would be uh, money on on military support and uh, again I repeat on on amplifying the defense and security efforts around and inside of Ukraine through through having a robust presence on the ground unfortunately the refugee numbers are going to be growing the expenses are going to be growing if Putin is not stopped once and for all and he only understands force he's fighting this war by scourged earth methods Mm. he's fighting this war until the very end he has no way back so the only way forward is to actually push him back into Russia and put an end to it and put a stop to it unfortunately at this point in time this can be done only if there's an, a force that will outweigh him uh, otherwise all the all the efforts all the taxpayers money going in will be just money not well spent at all so the war only ends when Putin is pushed back the war only ends when Russia deoccupies Ukraine, when Ukraine's borders are reinstated to their margins, internationally recognized since 1991, and when Putin pays for all the damage that he has caused to the Ukrainians, but also to the British people, to the Polish people, to the people of Europe, to the people of the United States of America, with his aggression and with his war crimes criminals must be punished if they go unpunished this gives signal to other criminals that they can follow suit the world cannot afford to have dictators to have empires come back and to live in fear of terrorist states do you think it's inevitable then that there'll be some nato involvement in ukraine in pushing putin back somehow or or will it will this carry on and, and until it gets to its 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 end 
I'll be frank, uh, leaders of the free world, as they like to call themselves, they just stand on the sidelines and they watch as this free world is being forged under mm -hmm. missiles and rockets and bombs. And they do nothing. This is not about leadership anymore. And this is definitely not about a free world, which they are so comfortable standing by on the sidelines and watching destroyed. And this is what NATO has become. This is what NATO is about right now. So maybe I, I would agree here with... Uh, with President Zelensky that maybe it's time to move away from NATO in a way and to see who is willing out of the NATO states to actually take a confident stance and push back by force. And I'm sure that others will follow suit. And I'm sure that this is the way also to rehabilitate NATO and make it the strong alliance that it was meant to be and envisaged to be when it was first created grow a spine maybe for NATO because it needs, needs some help to be more more robust in, in helping Ukraine. NATO is a defense alliance. It was created as a defense alliance. Right now there's an attack. So NATO's true nature should have been to start the, the defense actions and activities. Instead NATO is saying that okay it's Ukraine not is not, member, Ukraine Ukraine is not a member so uh, we're not going to do anything. But uh, this war of aggression it's the start. I'm sure that NATO has plenty of excellent uh, war and military analysts and I'm sure that it doesn't take a genius to figure out that Putin is not going to stop at Ukraine that he's already hitting a military bases 20 kilometers off the border with Poland, well, a, a member state there's a sure a message being sent when a residential district in Zagreb, Croatia another member state is being hit by a drone with an explosive attached to it so messages are being plenty sent out by Putin and his forces all across NATO member states. Why is there no reaction? Is NATO really the defense alliance that it has to be? In this country, we have tens of thousands of people volunteering to take in refugees from Ukraine. What's your message to them? These are great people with a very big heart and I hope that th they will find the matching families for them <laughs> and um, I think that Ukraine will be forever grateful to all and each one of the UK citizens who's taking in Ukrainians and helping them. And just finally, if, if I were Boris Johnson, you're talking to him, to him now, what, what would you say to him? As we started, no fly zone. <laughs> That's it, simple, straightforward. Simple, straightforward. This is what can save us now and this is what can save Britain now as well. Well, Lesia Vasilenko, thank you so much for joining us on a busy day here in London and best of luck with your meetings. Thank you. Thank you. And to keep up to date with the ongoing war in Ukraine, do go to telegraph.co.uk for top analysis from our journalists and writers in country. If you're not a subscriber already, and if not, why not? Please go to telegraph.co.uk forward slash chopper to get your first month's access completely free of charge. And of course, don't forget to sign up to and listen to our podcast, Ukraine The Latest. Right, now do stay with us, listeners. Coming up, something completely different. I'll be catching up with Conservative Party Chairman Oliver Dowden to talk about Tory candidate lists, taxes, and if he's a posh Tory boy. I don't feel like I'm dressed the right way for a microphone like this. I should all be sort of leather clad and sweaty. Right after this. If you're finding this podcast interesting, you may also like our new daily podcast, Ukraine, the latest. Every weekday, The Telegraph's leading journalists bring you the latest news and the most informed analysis of President Putin's invasion of Ukraine. From our newsroom in London and from the ground. The Russian machine has been ground to a halt now for well over a week, and that is just staggering. NATO has to act now. It has to do more than it's currently doing. Otherwise, in this Ukrainian MP's words, you'll have to evacuate the whole continent. One video that we found to be incorrect was bomb squads seen in the Donbass region. The metadata of this clip shows that it was created in 2019, not today. Search Ukraine, the latest, in the same place you're listening to this and click follow so you don't miss an update. Now, politics in Westminster carries on as normal despite the appalling scenes in Ukraine. And this weekend, the Tories are holding their spring conference in Blackpool. The party is launching its plan to win the next general election. So I caught up with Oliver Dowden in his constituency in Bushy for a stroll down memory lane. 
Oliver Dowden, we're here in Toulouse Restaurant on Bushy Heath High Street. Why aren't we in the Red Lion pub? <laughs> well, I, I, I've given up drinking at lunchtime, <laughs> so that's probably the, the main reason. Also, they do some excellent salt beef yes, here, we so have I had re- a s- recommend it to anyone that's in the, the area. We had a salt beef sam- sandwich, and you are the MP for this area, aren't you? I MP am, the Hearts yeah. Mayor. And you, you, you brought our podcast out of our usual secure environment, maybe, of the Red Lion pub, because you, 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 know, you want to get a different you want to sort of almost reshape how maybe people see you and the party well look i think people can characterize the conservative party in what, whatever they, way they want what what i see in the party in my experience in so many other people's experiences and you've you've met some people from my uh, my party who happened to be in yes, the, in in cafe toulouse it's people from all different backgrounds all different walks of life committed to basic conservative values you know working hard and providing for yourself and your family and ultimately for your community and your country in the way I've been able to do so it's about sacrificing the needs of today for the interests of tomorrow and it's also about being a bit skeptical about some of this sort of cancel culture wokery and everything else that's going on I think that's a new battlefront that's opening up in in political debate well we'll we'll come on to that I mean you, you 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 yourself were part of the Cameron Project, and you were Chief of Staff in Number 10, or not Chief of Staff, but you had a key role in Number 10, didn't you, with David Cameron. You, and you were seen as one of those posh boys, but you weren't really posh at all, were you? Uh, no, I wasn't posh. I was, no. um, I've, I've always been aspirational, but I, we, we, we're sat here in Bushy, just down the road is, is Palmer's School. That's where I, yep. uh, I had a great education, local, local state school, and it, was, uh, it has some selection now, but I was a... It's comprehensive entry when I went there and I was fortunate enough from there to win a place at Cambridge University studied law came from a very ordinary background my yeah. mum worked in the local shop and dad worked in the wire factory again just just down the road from here in in Watford uh, until he lost his and job in the 90s that, recession does your background then reflect what you want the modern Tory party to be yes and I'm actually going to reopen the candidates list and I want to drive genuine diversity in the candidates list and that means a diversity of different backgrounds a diversity of different experiences and that means making sure that not just that we have people from certain professions whether it's law or accountancy or whatever all different experiences but also all different parts of the country because the conservative party more than at any time i think possibly in its history genuinely reflects all parts of the country. We have seats like Bishop Auckland, or seats in Durham that we, we would never have imagined we would have had a, a generation ago. I want the very best from all different walks of life and all different experiences. I think the challenge we have, and I have seen this as party chairman, is we do need more people from outside London and the South East. And I want to make sure that we go out there and recruit those very best people. Women make up half the population of this country. We need to make sure that we have good female candidates. I'm in politics like many of your listeners, I'm sure. I was inspired by Margaret Thatcher. The the, the story of the the grocer's daughter from Grantham inspired me as a kid growing up around here to get involved in the Conservative Party. And to make sure this happens, I've also looked at the way in which we select people. So I've got four key tests that we're looking at. First of all, have people got political conviction? You know, we need people to believe in the Conservative Party. But I don't mean you have to have, you know, pounded the streets for for 25 years, although I very much welcome that as as chairman, but people who share that sound Conservative disposition. Good judgment, integrity and life experience. Those are the four things that we're looking for. On political conviction, that's that's an interesting thing to say because a lot of people don't know what Toryism is at the moment. What the national insurance increase is going, going up in April in the old days, you knew that conservatism was low taxes, you know, stronger defence, low taxes, that kind of thing. What is Toryism now? Because you are increasing taxes. The government spending is going up. Well, look, on, on, on taxes, I'm, I'm very clear that what we've seen now has to be the high watermark, both in si- terms of the size of the government. And by the way, because we made those right calls, we made those right calls in terms of reopening the economy. It's allowing us to roll back the COVID state. That is the first step to to reducing the size of government, enabling us to cut taxes. And also, we can't have taxes going up anymore. The direction has to be downwards. And I think people... Before the next election. 
well, that's for the that's for that's just you and me and Toulouse uh, Cafe. Yeah, you can say what you yes, like. And a, a, a few few constituents are watching interestedly this conversation. We're we're having. But you want to see a direction travel before, before the election, don't you? I, I didn't join the Conservative Party to make to take more of people's money away in taxation. I've always believed that the people that know best how to spend money are people themselves, not yeah. the government. For me. There's, there's two things in terms of, of conservative values. The first is this kind of Thatcher hard work aspiration getting on in life. But I've never believed that the Conservative Party has stood for knowing the price of everything and the value of nothing. Equally important to conservatism is the seeing conservatism, preserving the things that we, we cherish, whether it's beautiful towns and villages and indeed you see many of those in in my constituency whether that is the monarchy our countryside uh, the the great traditions of our nation that motivates me as much as a yeah. conservative do, do you feel that the diversity in the candidates list is a degree, is, is a bit of woke nonsense too isn't it because you're trying to find people who symbolize things and that's really where the woke brigade are half the time no you see i think this is the mistake people make so what i don't want is tick box diversity so that's to say you you meet this characteristic here you go you're in but real diversity means having different experiences in life. It means when we're in Parliament, we're debating the common fisheries policy and our successor to the common fisheries policy. Now we have independence. We're forward we to have, seeing it. We have somebody who has experience of fishing. When we're talking about farming and trade deals, we have people who are act- who were, were farmers. Planting when we're wheat. talking about levelling up, we have we have a kid who grew up in a council estate in. Newcastle, who can talk about it from, from genuine conviction and experience. And of course we need to make sure we have the very brightest and the best. And I, you know, I say this as, as somebody that was very fortunate to, to go from my local state school to, to Cambridge University. I want people from the best universities in the country to, to serve this country. But I don't just want that, that kind how of will experience. You get, how will you find them? That's a, that's a challenge. I know you opened your headquarters in Leeds last week, so you've now got a, a, a formal outpost in the north of England. How, how will you find these candidates? And actually, it's interesting you mentioned the opening of the Leeds HQ. We're going to start doing candidate assessments in our Leeds HQ. The great thing about having Leeds is that we can serve uh, all of uh, the, the north and the Midlands. Those are areas where we've gained a huge number of seats. I've appointed an excellent new vice chair for candidates, yes. Mike, Mike, Penning. Mike Penning, who's going to be out there finding uh, great people. Again, Mike's experience, both in, in, in the army and the fire brigade, proud working class Tory. We need that kind of diversity of experience. We need people like Kemi Badnock. Think about how she's been taking on established interests. We need people like... Uh, Miriam Cates, who was a former science teacher, it's that richness. And they and they they are MPs and they are good MPs already. How do you find how do you find the ones you want to make the party more diverse regionally? Where how do you find them? Where do you go? Is it council well, lists? The great the great thing is we've now got people in all those areas. We've 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 got people in Durham who are Conservative MPs who can who can those people. We're building the infrastructure there. We're electing councillors in in those places. Where is the spiritual heart of the party now? Is it in London? Is it in Leeds? Is it Birmingham? Where is, where is the beating heart of the party? Has well, it moved north? I've always felt that the Conservative Party is at its strongest when it stands for the values of, of Middle England. And you're sat in a, a cafe like this in Bushy, my constituency. The people I've been talking to before this interview, those sound conservative values. People Telegraph that, subscribers I should say. Uh, this yes, and she's, she's looking forward to, <laughs> to, to reading this, the, this interview when, it, when it, it comes out. Um, and I think it's people that just you know, most people in this country, and I've seen this even more as chairman of the Conservative Party they just want to get on with their lives, they want to provide a good start for, for their, their children, they want to be able to have a nice house have nice education, decent hospitals, they don't care about ideology and all, all those sort of things but they know that in order to do that you do need to have a dynamic economy and you need to have lower taxes and all those other things that conservatives have do you why the party is losing its way a bit with banning trying to ban fragua um, uh, bare skin pelts stop monkeys being kept in cages I mean these are all tiny little parts of the country and what, what they get up to I mean uh, why is the government getting so involved in these, these, these areas but, but do you know what I, I actually think the conservative party has a very 
proud record of compassion and welfare for animals. And uh, I know that Margaret Thatcher was actually very cared very much about the welfare of animals. And we've always introduced progressive measures, but but I've always thought that the principal thing should be individuals being able to to make those choices, have the freedom to make those choices. But you're, you're trying to ban them, aren't you? You're trying to ban those things. Like Fragua, for example. I mean, he, he, not everyone eats Fragua, but I think a lot, some listeners may think it should be a right to choose whether you want to have uh, a pate that's created in a, in a cruel way or not. Well, I think as Conservatives, we, um, I certainly, and, and all my Conservative colleagues, abhor cruelty. Yes. Uh, but I, I think people are capable of making those decisions themselves. Well, what's a woman, Oliver Dowden? Of course, we all know that... Um, that biology determines a woman but I would also say we are open and tolerant as a society and that we recognise the the legal right of people to choose their gender identity and I think as conservatives we must and we should respect those things but I think that is pretty simple to be able to have both those propositions and I think what what I notice lots of women say this to me they say yeah how, how come it's become a point of controversy what a what a woman is that's not in any way trying to exclude the rights of of trans people in this country it's right that we protect those those rights but the idea that people have become so mealy mouthed they can't even explain those basic propositions like that 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 causes frustration to people there's not a report out by onward the think tank run by Will, Will Tanner, who used to work with Theresa May recently, it talked about how the next election, the battleground, will be Northern England, which gives a context to what you're announcing today. Um, do you, it all, that report also said that if, if the party isn't clear about what Toryism is, it will allow a kind of UKIP-type party to fight you on those kind of core, in those blue-collar seats, on core kind of Tory issues. Is that what you worry about at the moment? Well, I don't worry about it in the sense that I believe, and I know that the the Prime Minister and the Chancellor and others have a very uh, sound sense of Conservative values. And by the way, we demonstrated that uh, at the last election when we actually delivered Brexit, what people voted for. We demonstrated that by taking us out of lockdown. And we'd still be in lockdown now if Keir Starmer was Prime Minister. But I also think we need to recognise things that have changed. And for me... The, the crisis in Ukraine and Russia means we have to do two things. First of all, we need to be robust in, in facing down the despicable Putin regime and these poor people that are under the heel of barbarism. But we also need to be tough in dealing with the consequences that flow from that and particularly the cost of living consequences in, in this country. And for far too long, we have been dependent on Russian oil and gas. We need to have a genuine... Uh, independent energy strategy and by the way in doing that that also means that we shouldn't take a doctrinaire approach to to net zero and green policy that is to say that of course uh, in the longer run uh, as we approach net zero by 2050 as as, as, law, as we've pledged in law we will have all those um, uh, offshore wind and we're, we're, we're global leaders it's solar and everything else but we're also going to need nuclear it's, and we need to Uh, Labour shamefully neglected investment in nuclear and in that transition period we we need to make sure we don't disincentivise oil and gas production in in this country because it's clear we can't rely on it elsewhere and I think that's the the challenge in terms of being tough on the consequences of of this conflict making sure we have a genuine independent energy policy and the f word fracking the the f word will be dealt with by the prime minister and the <laughs> the, the, the the business secretary i've always felt that um, we should we should i think we should be open to all energy sources however of course that has to be balanced against with safety uh, with safety and everything else precisely. and how you define safety is, is possibly possibly an answer do you worry though that you mentioned cost of living and that, that is the is that the single biggest danger to the Tory party in winning the next election because we saw how it crippled the Labour government in the 1970s in the last major oil shock and that could be what happens to the Tory party well we need to be very very mindful of the the risk caused by the increase in the, the, the cost of living. That is why it's essential that we have an independent energy policy. That's why it's essential that we follow measures like the ones outlined by the Chancellor in terms of covering the, the, the cost of living. Because 
that really, you know, we've talked about lots of political issues. That is the thing that is front of mind of voters up and down the country. They rely on Conservatives to be able to make sure that they can pay their mortgage, they can fill their tank with fuel, and people are going to be squeezed in the coming months because of this, uh, the, the existing increase in energy. We need to be on the side of people in, in dealing with that. It's going to be a huge challenge, isn't it? I mean, and you, the government's always blamed for these things. It may not be your fault, it may be global tipped on the plate shifting but the government gets blamed well well th- this is my um, argument we have we have it, two big causes of of this inflation covid and the supply chains and now this energy situation caused by the conflict in ukraine we need to show the same resolution yes. that we demonstrated in in dealing with the the threat from russia in dealing with the domestic consequences of people's costs of living in terms of Russia, are, are, you, are you going through the donations to your party in the past 10 years and maybe returning money to donors who may not be acceptable now? No, we don't need to do that because we have never taken Russian money. And actually, I think this is a really Im- important point. I think those people, the Labour Party in particular, that are, th- are constantly making allegations need to actually front up about it. Because if they're saying that somebody who was born in the Ukraine or born in Russia but is now a British citizen and utterly despises what Putin is doing to, to the Ukraine... Is, is somehow precluded from participating in our, our national life because of their nationality of birth. Would they say that about somebody that was born in India? Would they say that about somebody that was born in Pakistan? Would they, would so they say it, that... Is it was, racist then, do you think, almost? Well, I think Labour just need to think carefully about that. That's all I say. I don't, I think, I don't like throwing the accusations around, and I'm not, I'm not going to go that that far but I think they need to be very careful about that. Jacob Rees-Mogg said on this podcast last week that perhaps more could have been done against oligarchs post 2014 and the Crimea annexation. Do you you agree with him? Well I think you could go um, further back than that. For me the roots of this uh, conflict lie in the irresolution that Parliament showed when the Assad crossed that red line with chemical weapons And Parliament failed to vote in terms of action. Then Obama failed to act. As a consequence of that, Russia saw an end to Syria. And the sort of barbarism that is being perpetrated in Ukraine was practiced in places like Aleppo. And for me, that that, that is the big lesson, that you have to show resolution. And it has been the case throughout our history that Western countries, particularly the United States and the United Kingdom, have shown that resolution in facing down threats. If chemical weapons are used in, in Ukraine, do NATO get involved then? Is that a red line for this government? Uh, I, uh, the Defence Secretary has, has, has dealt with this, and we're not in the business of, of putting out uh, red lines or, or answering hypotheticals about But I think what you have seen, what I've taken great art from, and uh, I, I talked in Washington a few weeks ago about my concerns about our belief in liberal Western democratic values. I've been heartened by the fact that the, the West has come together so strongly to, to deal with this crisis. Yeah. Do, you, do you think cancelling Russian things like, like vodka to compare the Meerkat adverts, even Tchaikovsky at concerts is an appropriate response? Well, I, I, I don't think we should be in the, the business of attacking rich Russian cultural Heritage, just just I uh, say the same thing about rich Chinese heritage and elsewhere. These, they they are great nations of the world. The the sad thing about Russia is that it is currently led by somebody that that, that is a despotic tyrant, and his true colours have been shown during this crisis. It's the Conservative Scottish Conference uh, um, uh, today, isn't it? And also tomorrow, it's the your Spring Conference in Blackpool. Um, just last week, uh, Douglas Ross, the Scottish Tory leader, withdrew his letter calling for your boss, Boris Johnson, to, to resign. Um, was, that, was it even helpful that Douglas Ross put a letter in the first place? Well, I don't think it's helpful, and I say this categorically as Conservative Party chairman, it's not helpful for anybody to put letters in uh, against our Prime Minister. And I think what you've seen during this crisis is the resolution that the Prime Minister is showing in a crisis. Leadership, genuine leadership just as he showed leadership in getting Brexit done, driving the vaccine programme and reopening. And I know it's boring to keep on saying, but it's worth remembering, because I'll tell you, that is what people judge leaders on, those big calls. I've got to ask you the question again, which almost sounds ridiculous, given what's going on in Ukraine, but should he resign if he he gets a a penalty notice from the police? 
I'm, I'm confident the Prime Minister will not get that penalty But should notice. he resign if he gets one? Well, it's, the issue is not going to arise. So I don't, I'm not going to start uh, speculating on something that I don't think will arise. Jacob rees Mogg didn't know what I meant by Partygate when I asked him last week on the podcast. You think the country's moved on from Partygate? Uh, you may want it to, but has it? Uh, I think uh, what I see front of mind for, for voters is, of course, the conflict in Ukraine, but also um, how how they're going to make uh, ends meet. And I think if they have a Conservative government, which they do, which is on their side in dealing with, with cost of living, when it comes to the next election, if they are convinced that the Conservative Party is going to ensure that them and their families have better prospects and a better future, that is what voters will, will vote on. I have no doubt about that. I'm just all. finally, um, Oliver, Oliver Dowden, I mean, again, we're, we're in a cafe, the Toulouse Cafe in, in Bushy Heath, you and me talking, no one's listening. When's the election? <laughs> Uh, I've, I've always worked on the basis that we're going to aim for 2024, but that's at the Prime Minister's discretion. You want to have some time, don't you? Did you, did you, did you worry that, that, that there's so much going on, you know, Brexit, obviously, but then COVID, then the war, um, that there's no time to deliver on what you want to do, which is levelling up and making, improving life, these, these seats you won in 19? I think you make a very good point, and I think what the British people want and what the government is focused on is not elections. Of course, it's my job as the head of our election approach to make sure we're ready, but that is not where the Prime Minister's mind is at. That's not where the Cabinet's mind is at. Our minds are at delivering for the British people, and we've got to make sure we have that delivery before we go to the polls. Well, it's, it's a bit quieter now in the cafe, but when we first arrived, Oliver Dowd, and we were being mobbed by half the cafe who seemed to know you. I think you went around the tables high-fiving most of the people here. <laughs> did you, did you, uh, you grew up quite living here? I, I, I always say this is my, my home patch. I'm a, a local boy, and uh, in fact, my, my house isn't very far down the road, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy to show it well, to you if you want, Chris. Louisa, should we go and see, see his house? Yeah, why not? All right, OK. That's a good idea. Oliver Dowden, we're here. Well, here we are. Let's have a look. Yes, gosh, look at this. So there we are. I won't say the number because I don't want no, to, uh, to damage the value of the property <laughs> for who's currently there. And we're in Brickett Wood, and um, I would say it's an ordinary street. That's you know, it's nice. It's, that's your house there, is it? That is it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's no blue plaque on it. Why is that? Oh, I don't know. Well, th that was a major failing from English heritage. <laughs> we'll have to start a campaign. You've got to be that. dead for 50 years or yeah, 20 so years. I don't, I don't want to look too much up into it. Uh, I don't know. The wardrobes look maybe the same. The, the, I, so the bay window. That's yeah. that was from mum and dad's bedroom at the front there. Next to it, that's where my sister Lara was and then there's oh. the what would you say to them? when when do you when do you when do you move out of this house when when, how you uh, when I went to university yeah so, so uh, let's the, 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 say the 15 year old Oliver Down running out the front door <laughs> yeah. and you you said I'll be back here in 35 <laughs> years with a, a bloke from a telegraph interviewing yeah. me about being chairman of the Tory party what would you say to him I think I'd be pretty pleased yes <laughs> I was always sure a, I was a, I was a I was a Tory back then, so I was... Uh, yeah, but you've done pretty well, but not a lot of people are Tories. Not, they don't all come run the, them in party. Do you know what? I'm just remembering now. I wound my parents up in the 92 election because I put a, up in that window, I put a little Tory poster up that had come through the, the door <laughs> and they didn't spot it for ages. And then are, they they not, were, are they not Tories? They, they weren't Tories and they certainly didn't want Tory uh, posters <laughs> going up and uh, <laughs> the neighbours knowing about that. So, so, so your influence was Margaret Thatcher... Yeah. But not your parents. That's quite interesting because a lot of people's parents are the no, influence. No, my well, my nan was uh, my yeah. dad's mum was Labour through and through. They were, it was the of you were working class, we're Labour, and that's what my my dad sort of inherited, yeah. as it were. Mum was a bit more of a, a swing voter. I think she maybe gave gave her vote to to Margaret Thatcher in eighty three, but but Blair in ninety seven. That kind of are, uh, kind of are thing. these former council houses? The well, it's, they've actually got. They look like former council houses. That my parents did buy it under uh, right to buy essentially they were actually built for i believe for the handy page aircraft factory down the road they were sort of workers houses but i think by the time my parents moved in they certainly were renting it when they moved in and mm. bought it under i don't know it was, it was essentially right to buy yeah mm. and, it, and it, the, the sun did come out here when, when yeah you were it's, younger. it's a bit just, just <laughs> a bit gloomy today <laughs> it's, <gloomy> here. it's, <laughs> not, <laughs> it's a very nice place to to, uh, yeah. to, to, I mean, this to is if up, I, to paint a picture for listeners. This is, I would argue, Middle England. This is how 
most of the country lives, I think. Well, this, this is yes. how you, Do you imagine... Know this is one of my frustrations. When people talk about um, Middle England, sometimes people in the Tory party think of nice sort of, uh, yeah. you know, uh, detached country houses or whatever. But this is this is Middle England. This is where most people in this country live in a variety of... It's a road, a road of, of, of semis. And of, by the way, I'll tell you, houses. people were very proud to buy their yeah. their houses here and to, to live. And you can see that people have sort of over the years changed them a bit to, to suit their uh, mm. their taste so so I can remember every, they've all moved out now but the people that without getting too John Major-esque about yeah. it but they uh, <laughs> the, the people in each each of the houses yeah. yes. not all this is remember I remember him in the 92 election saying it's still there <laughs> yes remember, that, that's exactly uh, what uh, I was thinking that, 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 you, you haven't said that <laughs> Oliver Dowden thank you not at all well, as always, listeners, if you have anything to say about what we've heard from our guests today, please email me, chopperspolitics at telegraph.co.uk, or tweet me, I'm on Chopper's Podcast. Thank you to my guests this week, Lesia Vasilenko and Oliver Dowden. Thank you to my producers, Louisa Wales, Giles Gear, and Theodora Leludis. But most importantly of all, thank you to you, as ever, for listening. For more about what's happening in the world of Westminster politics, please sign up to my daily Chopper's Politics newsletter that goes into your email inbox when you want it. And the link to sign up is in the show notes to this episode. And don't forget also to sign up to my weekly Peterborough Diary column on the Telegraph's website at 7pm every Friday and in Saturday's newspaper. And of course, if you can, please do buy a copy of the Daily Telegraph. You won't regret it. Until next time, though, cheerio.